welcome to the Nerd Party. Hi, this is Henry Gilroy, co-executive producer of Star Wars Rebels. You're listening to Aggressive Negotiations. Aggressive Negotiations, a Star Wars podcast here on the Nerd Party Network, and I am just one of the hosts here, Matthew Rushing, and with me as he is every single single week, sucking down his favorite drink at the bar here in Most Pelgo, a little bit of spacha. That's right, with me, Jedi Master, John Mills. Now, a little bit of spacha will do you lots of, I guess, I don't know. That's the ad campaign I'm going with. Uh, glad to be here. Very excited about our potentially controversial topic tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say, go to the nerdparty.com, the nerdparty.com slash contact. You're going to be able to contact the show. Drop us an email. We read them all. We can't respond to them all, but we try to. You can, of course, follow us on Twitter at the Jedi Masters. You can follow the network at Joy Nerd Party, the Nerd Party on Facebook and Instagram. Those are all the places you can reach us. But Matt, as you can tell, I'm super duper excited to get into the topic, the question for this week. So, I let, let's go. Let, you you go ahead. You you throw the question because this was your idea. You wanted to talk about this, and I cannot wait to have this discussion and also see the ripple effect discussions that happen as a result. <laughs> so, um, you know, we have this brand new episode uh, of The Mandalorian, and uh, of course, uh, Chapter Nine was fantastic. We all loved it. And uh, I think I don't think I saw anybody who was like, eh, that was OK. I feel like it was like universal love. And so really, really excited to, you know, be able to talk about it. And so one of the things that y- you and I were kind of talking about just just offline, as we always do, we're, we're chatting every day with each other, um, even in these crazy times. And mm. so one of the things that we really uh, just started kind of batting around was this idea of like who's the better boba boba fett or cobb vanth um who Mm -hmm. by the way is a character from the uh aftermath series so they actually stuck with canon um that they had created and allowed this character to come on screen which pretty cool you know the fact that they were very consistent with what they've already put out so thankful that they didn't just overwrite it for some reason that they didn't need to um, so I, I guess that's the question that we were batting around. Like who, who's the better Boba? Who, who wears the armor better? You know, who I, you, and, and so I think there's many different ways to go with this. And so one of the things that I was thinking though, as to kind of a narrow it down was, I think it's really interesting that Boba Fett, you know, himself, uh, is mm-hmm. somebody who he uh, inherits this armor from his dad, who has gotten the armor from somewhere. We don't know where. We don't know how he got the armor, but it seems pretty clear that he found the armor somewhere. He's, he's you know, not uh, a Mandalorian. At least that's what canon tells us right now. So until they change that. Um, and so he's a man who just does what he wants with the armor, which is he, he follows in his father's footsteps and becomes a bounty hunter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And... um so my question then, too, was the, that really to kind of narrow it down a little bit at the beginning was, I feel like Cobb Vanth and the what he does with the armor, um, I'd have to say that as for somebody utilizing the tool of the armor, um, he's definitely using it for much more altruistic reasons than Boba Fett ever did. And therefore, and, and at least in that category, I would put him as the better Boba Fett. Okay. There's a lot to unpack with what you said, and we're going to have a lot of fun with this. I wholeheartedly disagree with the statement. He was a better Boba Fett because he might be more of a Mandalorian in the way that he lives, but that doesn't make him a better Fett because the Fets were. This is true. This is true. So, so that is me being uh, shallow and pedantic and attacking, uh, you know, the the letter of your question, not the spirit of your question. Now, part two of that being he used the armor for better 
you know, in a better fashion, in a uh, uh, you not not just in terms of his motivations for it, but also in terms of how he used the armor. Uh, I would say that Cobb Vanth, as presented here in uh, in the Mandalorian, does use the Boba Fett armor in a way that is smarter and better, using it as a tool. And the simple fact that he comes across it like a tool, he he views it as a means of survival, not just as a means of reputation, because that's what that's what Jango Fett. If Jango Fett was not a Mandalorian, if he was not, I still think they were lying on Mandalore, but whatever. If he was not, then he's using the armor as a cheat. As is therefore Boba, whereas Cobb Vanth is using the armor the way that armor should be used, which is, you know, as a uh, as a tool. Now, I will go another step further or farther. I always forget which one to use on that one. It's one and I will one. say I will say that I agree with you that he makes better use of the armor simply because Boba Fett sort of stumbles through his surviving with the armor until a blind man uh, hits his jetpack and kills him, right? And he also misses Luke when he has Luke dead to rights. He should have been able to shoot Luke in the back. So Boba Fett's reputation is a little bit larger than his capabilities. And so on that, I will agree. However, yeah, I, mean, I never, I'm, let me put it this way. I never see Cobb miss a shot. So correct. Here's, here, here's another thing though. Being, you know, somebody who remembers the EU, which I know you do as well as I do, as well as plenty of people listening to, did you see shades of that original mythos about Boba Fett of journeyman protectorate Jaster Mareel, the way that they tried to spin that in Tales of the Bounty Hunters uh, in in the old EU story? Did you see some of Jaster Mareel about the way they treated Cobb Vanth in this episode? Yeah, I mean, you know... Cobb, I think, feels like, as you were mentioning earlier, he kind of feels more in line with what we see for the Mandalorians, this character who has this sense of honor uh, to him, Mm -hmm. you know, and of course, you know, it very much in line with what we kind of see of Din, right? Din Djarin is is full of honor, uh, and um, the Mandalorians that we have come to know, you know, um, even, even, you know, characters like... um, you know what I I think of of the characters we got to know in the Clone Wars like Satine or even her sister Bo Katan, you know um, they're both acting honorably but from different perspectives, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know Bo thinks she's doing what's right for the Mandalorians and um, because she cares about the Mandalorians and you know uh, on the other side Satine thinks she's doing what's right because she cares about the Mandalorians and they're just coming at it from different perspectives. So there I think honor goes way back all the way back to. Uh, and and that's where I think, you know, we can see uh, the dishonor of people like, um, you know, a Pre Vizsla um, and, mm-hmm. and those type of characters where they're, they're kind of going against type. Uh, and so uh, so with that, I, I do ha- see him being kind of more in that line with the journeyman protector. Um, you know, Boba Fett, it's interesting, too, because, you know, we we learn a lot more about the character in the Clone Wars. And what we see in him is uh, somebody who is very selfish. He takes after his father. He's out for himself. He's just a man trying to make it in the universe. And he could care less mm-hmm. about anybody else. In fact, even when he realizes that it's a child in that box, in that episode with, uh, you know, where they're delivering that bounty to that weird fish king dude you know under the Mm -hmm. crystal caves uh and uh, he doesn't care you know um it's it's asajj ventress who cares so um i think you know uh in many ways the clone wars kind of makes boba and more irrep are are more irreparable character than beforehand you know like he's less redeemable in my mind um whereas you know again we when we're talking about the, these characters and, and their honor codes, you know, uh, man, Cobb is like miles above Boba. 
Well, I mean, Cobb Vanth is the classic, you know, sheriff of the small town. Right. Like exactly. A, a very yeah. Western roots sort of thing. I mean, but let me ask. We even have uh, what's his face from Justified playing him. You know. Right. So, but but let me ask you this fun, question. So nobody's yelling at me. Right. <laughs> let me ask you this question seriously. I read the first two Aftermath books, and somebody mentioned, "Oh, Cobb Vanth. Yes, he carried over from Aftermath." I do not remember. I. Somebody filled me in and said, oh, he's in one of the interludes, which is yeah, probably why I don't remember yeah. him. What do we get? I mean, there are probably people listening who either don't remember it or didn't read it like my, you know, either didn't read it or don't remember it like me. Right. What was he about in the aftermath interlude? Because my, my impression always was that the interludes were the story group bits that that uh, uh, Wendig was told to include. Right. And that he he wedged in there um, because he didn't want to tell those stories necessarily. So what do we get from him in the Aftermath books? What What is Cobb Vanth? Is there anything to indicate this is – was this surprising that he was this way? Is this uh, simply borrowing a character who had a very loose sketch? Yeah, or, I mean – how was I, that? From what I remember, because I haven't read the – you know – the, the aftermath books since they've come out and f- from what I recall um, you know basically it was about this character who had the Mandalorian armor uh, that was found by some Tusken Raiders so it was alluding to the fact that it you know it was the the Mandalorian armor of Boba Fett um, so and and that's pretty much it I don't I don't really remember in there being anything else about it so i'd have to go back to read it specifically to see you know who the the character turned out to be or if there was anything more than that but that's really all i remember so it, but in the aftermath book what was it a case of the tuscan raiders found it and traded it to the jawas and so that's a difference that we see is that there's some sort of chain of custody that we didn't see uh, up to that point. Or is I, it I mean, just I don't remember always... the Tuscans having it at all. I just remember this guy okay. having it that he had gotten it from. I mean, basically the same kind of thing you hear okay. from him in the episode is that he had gotten it from some Jawas. So if I remember okay. correctly, that that's that's what I remember. But again, I haven't read those books since they came out. But so. But basically it was a couple of pages in a book. Yeah. Released years ago. Yeah. See, I and that's what's so interesting to me, right, is because everybody said, oh, this is a character. And even you mentioned at the beginning, oh, this is a character from canon that they kept around, which I think is neat. But at the same time, keeping a character from canon, quote unquote, like this is this seems like they said, oh, well, we've got this character. Oh, we might as well. OK, yeah, we'll use that name. Or do you think this is a conscious effort to start to bring together those disparate elements and try to lend some sort of story continuity like we've been begging for ever since the sequel trilogy started up. I mean, you think the Cobb I, I think, is like our first step toward yeah, that? Yeah, I just think what it is is that, you know, it's all supposed to be canon, and so they had they had to use the character. Um, I, I think... I think the thing about it is, is that you know that, like we said, that what is in aftermath is not a big deal, you know. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, it, it's not this huge thing, and so because of that, it gives them the opportunity uh, to be able to, you know, do what they want with the character. Really, um, you know, it's there's not a there's not a ton in aftermath or Empire's End that. Um, or even life debt that really makes them have to, um, you know, I think redo the character, you know? So, so here, here's a question for you because you said earlier that Boba Fett in the Clone Wars series is presented as a much less redeemable character than, uh, you know, we would have preferred or, or then would seem sort of thing. That last shot that everybody loves from chapter nine of the Mandalorian where we see Tamir Morrison, presumably as Boba Fett, living on Tatooine. Do you get any sort of redemption vibe? Or do you get a vibe of... Like, basically, I know that we only get one shot. Okay? I, I know that there's not a lot to work with. It's just the the surprise at the end. Which is a lot like the surprise of the Darksaber at the end of Chapter 8. Where it's, oh my gosh, this is a thing... For, for, that ties everything together sort of thing. 
if somebody were to say to you, judging by that one shot, do you see a Boba Fett who has amended his ways and has possibly gone down that path of redemption? Or do you see somebody who barely survived and just decided to lay low because he'd taken his lumps and there was no point in going forward? Yeah, so to me... The I mean, seeing that, and we're talking, I mean, this is the character of Boba Fett. I think Boba Fett uh, has kind of once and for all, to me, this once and for all kind of shows that Boba Fett was never a Mandalorian. To, for him to give up the armor was not a big deal. Uh, and to me, I think Boba Fett, it looks like he's kind of living as a Tusken Raider. Uh, or, or, you know, at least in harmony with them, um, you know, he's got the same gaffy stick, he's got the, you know, the same type of rifle, um, and there's a possibility, maybe he's the one who, um, we saw coming up to Fennec, you know, after she had died, there's that possibility, Mm -hmm. but I, I, my, my honest hope is that he's a character who's given it all up, and he's got, like, a family, you know, and, and I feel like it would be really interesting, because, you know, we see that very much in line with um, uh, other clones. We saw that in the Clone Wars, the the clone right. who d- deserted and had a family. So I kind of think that would be the coolest way to go with Boba Fett. I, you know, not making him um, what he was in the EU or even trying to right. do that. Um, I think it's, it's just um, – it, it would be so much neater to really see him, um, ha- like you said, He's turned over a completely new leaf, and in fact, maybe he doesn't even go by the name Boba Fett anymore, you know, um, after getting out of the Sarlacc. You know, maybe he's used this as the opportunity to truly start over and and start off new, and I think that makes sense with the fact that he would have given up the armor, you know? Right. Like, I, I think there's a significance to seeing him watch the armor leave. Yeah, absolutely. He never went. He never went back for it. Yeah, he's. Fine I mean, he could have probably it. gotten it back if he wanted. You know, I mean, well, he's if he was still that person, good at killing. You know, and so there's there's a part of me that would love, and I know that there are, the usual crew would be like, oh, that's small universe thinking, but I think it would be so much fun if he basically took up residence in Obi Wan's old abandoned hut. So that 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 would be kind of neat for me, I think. You know, Obi Wan yeah, leaves yeah. Tatooine and never goes back, and Boba Fett finds this deserted house and says, "Oh, cool. All right, fine. I'll live here." And I think you know, and that would leave sort of a, a a residual neat thing because I would also think that he could potentially find stuff that Obi Wan left behind when he unexpectedly left Tatooine. There was a trunk of stuff, so there are things that Obi Wan left behind on Tatooine that probably would have been helpful toward Boba Fett's uh, rehabilitation, as it were, because he'd probably find stuff where he'd be like, oh, my gosh, you know, the life my father taught me was a lie, and I I should be a better person sort of thing. So it's almost like Obi-Wan acting as a redeemer by uh, proxy of his stuff that he left behind would, I think, be an interesting arc uh, for for Boba Fett to have led, but yeah. I do I do agree. I think it's neat that he is a part of Tatooine because that was one question that we had in season one of The Mandalorian was he went to Tatooine for ship repairs, and we said, well, maybe you know, and we talked about it when we did our commentary. Well, you know, Tatooine is a known place. They say Mos Eisley. They don't say Tatooine. They say Mos Eisley uh, to. Graham off Tarkin. So Mos Eisley is a well enough known town that you can say its name. And even though it's a place on a world in a million world empire, people know it that easily. And so it is interesting that they follow up with another Tatooine episode. And the Mandalorian says, I've spent a lot of time on Tatooine and never heard of a Mandalorian there. Now, we know that the Mandalorian doesn't even know about Jedi, right? Because when, when he's told by the, the, the armorer that he has to try to find, you know, this race of wizards and reunite uh, the child with them, he's like, uh, I'm supposed to, you know, put him with a race of wizards? What? And um, so that speaks, I think, in support to the idea that Boba Fett 
and Jango Fett never were Mandalorians because their names are not known in the coverts. Their names are not spoken. And you would think that lends more credence to something that we've talked about, about that is a big deal then, that Boba Fett is out there in The Empire Strikes Back in Mandalorian armor and not a Mandalorian. That would make him, I think, one of the most despised people by the Mandalorians. Like, if he hadn't, quote unquote, died on Tatooine, they probably wanted to take him out to begin with because he was out there, uh, you know, ruining their reputations, as it were. Yeah. And I, I mean, it'll be really interesting to see, you know, uh, what happens with the Night of a Thousand Tears? Mm-hmm. You know that Gideon talks about. Where does that fall uh, in the timeline? How would, might that impact Boba Fett as well? Might that be a reason for him deciding to give up the armor when he gets out of the Sarlacc? Um, I don't know. I'm just I'm merely speculating. So I mm-hmm. because I think timeline would would make a big difference, but. You know, I think it's just really interesting because to me, uh, what I, the the most the the fascinating thing to me is watching this story play out in the sense that I think it's much more interesting if the Fets themselves were never Mandalorians and they're just people who who had the armor. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Jango had gotten the armor somewhere. We know they're obviously people who trade in Mandalorian armor. Um, you know, the, the, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Din went and saw one of those people, right? Um, this is somebody who, who makes a living out of, uh, capturing Mandalorians, taking their armor and selling it for exorbitant prices. So, um, I would expect that that would be something that you would have seen even in the past. And so it, to me, it kind of, uh, it, it creates a really interesting theme then for Star Wars if there if these are just people like Cobb and Fett who have just found the armor, what do you do with a tool like that? Do you use it for your own mm-hmm. gain or do you use it for the the benefit of others? And so and that's that fits so well within the Star Wars mythos and the storylines of Star Wars and as we have talked about many times just kind of the 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 rhyming nature of Star Wars, that is the theme of Star Wars. Do you live the selfish life or do you live the mm-hmm. selfless life? And so what we have here is the is the juxtaposition of two people with the same exact armor doing two completely different things with the armor. Um, and to me, that's what I think would create the best story because it fits so well with the rest of Star Wars. And just to tie it in, you know, as, as we're rounding third here, as it were, I think there's an interesting parallel there with Anakin's saber. Anakin does great things with yeah, his saber. True. Then he does terrible things with his saber. Luke does wonderful things, you know, wielding that that artifact. And then arguably uh, Ray does as well. And so that in and of itself, you have this uh, this artifact, this ancestral artifact, if you will, that gets passed down like the charmed sword. This is the charmed armor. And to your point, we see that it's how the person uses a thing that is important, not the thing itself. The lightsaber is a tool of destruction or it's a tool of defense and unity. It depends on who's wielding it. The armor, likewise. Uh, the blaster, likewise. Any any tool is neutral it's who's using it that determines whether it's good or bad that's why you know and you know the sith bleed their crystals you know like that that in and of itself also speaks to it but it speaks that idea of the the sacred artifact that gets passed down you know is arthur a good king or a bad king well excalibur is a magical sword and it just deter, you know, it's Arthur who determines whether that's a good thing that he wields it. John, so what are we taught? Throwing a sword at you is not the way to start an aristocracy. Yes, right. Exactly. I'm being <laughs> help, help. I'm, I'm being, being repressed. repressed. I'm being repressed. Um, uh, for anybody who does not know, <laughs> that is from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Please watch it. 
yeah, please, please, if you please don't know where that's it. from, please do watch it. Um, yes, absolutely. You know, I think the cool thing about this too. My wife was saying she saw a really funny meme, uh, and it was a picture of Boba Fett on one side, and it's like what it looks like on the mannequin, and on the other side is Cobb <laughs> Fett, and what it looks like <laughs> on me. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I just, I kind of, I kind of love that idea. Like this is a guy too. You know, the armor doesn't fit him perfectly. Obviously, the helmet doesn't fit him great because it's not you know it wasn't built for his head and, or anything like that um so he's a little gangly in it but again the the way that he uses is to protect a town just as a good sheriff would protect a town and uh mm-hmm. you know the fact that he would be willing to give up the armor you know because he barters with it as a way to protect the town. And what I love mm-hmm. is that, that, you know, when you, you get to the end of the episode and he hands the armor over to Din and he's like, you let your people know I, I'm not the one who busted that, you know. Uh, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Um, and then he's like, I hope our paths cross, cross again. And Din says, I hope so, too. And what I think is really neat is to see. You know, Din can keep, kind of keeps running into these people that are could become part of his posse at any time. Like he he he's so good at creating friends and not enemies. Let me ask you a question. Just one last question before we go. We know that Din was a foundling who came on board as a child, and that the foundlings are that we saw children in the covert. I hope they survived when the Imperials showed up. Do you think it's possible that somebody like Cobb Vanth could join the Mandalorian way as an adult? Is it some is it something where you have to be a like the Jedi have to be a child and be inculcated in it or could Cobb Vanth as an adult say I believe this is the way take me in give me the armor I will never take the helmet off again. Do you think that that is something that could work? Yeah, I mean, I that's a great question, um, and I really wish I knew the answer to. Uh, and I, I think you know, hopefully we will get the answer to because I, again, uh, that's a part of Mandalorian culture. I would love to see filled out. You know, like I would absolutely love to see filled out. Well, and and the thing is, since we know that Mandalore is a creed now and not a race. Every religion has a pathway for the convert. Right, yeah. That's so true. it would make right. sense that the Mandalorian could bring somebody in as an adult to become a Mandalorian. It doesn't have to be from childhood. Because, that, mm-hmm. it, you know, and again, we've discussed this many, many times. That's the downfall of both the Sith and the Jedi is that they believe you have to be inculcated from childhood and leads to the rigid rule, blah, 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 that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, that would be a really interesting avenue to explore especially because you know like you said we always see the mandalorian making friends queel and uh cobb vanth and cara dune these are all people that we could eat you know if they have a pathway you could offer to them and say you know if you think right. this is the way then this is the way no i i no i so i what i think you're what is so interesting about that is that it is the Mandalorian has just opened up so many doors for storytelling and, and questions mm-hmm. for us to ask, right? And I think that's the thing that makes it so much fun is that we really do have the ability to ask these questions. We have the ability to really dive into a culture in the way that we never thought possible, you know? And so uh, – and, you know, Boba Fett is is a a part of that, you know? And, and um, I think – to me, uh, I think what would be kind of neat, and this is just uh, – so I'm going to ask you this question as, as we uh, look to get out of here. But mm-hmm. would – do you want to see Boba Fett again? Would you want to see Boba Fett again or would you rather him kind of just disappear into the sun's, sun's set um, and just leave it open? Magnificent question. Because it's a question I was actually going to throw at you. <laughs> and I, so you beat me to the punch. I can honestly say I would be happy either way. And I know that that is a hedge. But if you're going to force me to choose a preference. Wow. 
prefacing this by saying I would never in a million years be disappointed if this team decided to do the opposite of what my knee-jerk reaction is. They have delighted and surprised me nine episodes in a row now. I have full and complete faith in the creative team behind The Mandalorian. But if you were to ask me, I'm a producer on the show, um, and if they would like to hire me, totally willing. Yeah, that but sounds it, great. It, I, I, you know, I, I'll work for both you. I'll of be us. your assistant. There you go. There you go. Exactly. I, you know what? I make a mean cup of coffee. That's all I'm going to say. So if you have me in that production office and you say, you know, Jedi Master John Mills, do we ever see Boba Fett again? My knee jerk reaction is no. Leave that scene. We'll all run with it. We'll all have a great time with it. And we'll all debate what happened before and what happened after. And again, saying full faith in this team, if they decide to come back, totally valid in my book. What about you? So I never thought I really wanted Boa Fett back at all. You know, I, I and and so if mm-hmm. they were to go the way um that I think would be most interested that if we saw him again, that it would be that he has completely turned the corner. And mm-hmm. would be somebody who is willing to help find other Mandalorians uh, and to seek out uh, and to protect the child for some reason. I, I think that would be uh, – and because he's a family man himself. And mm-hmm. so that mm-hmm. – I would love – I mean, you know, Star Wars is all about redemption. And so to me, right. redeeming the character of Boba Fett in that way would be fantastic. In fact – wouldn't it be cool if, like, we found out, you know, his his wife, uh, you know, he he saved or something, you know, uh, the sand woman right. he saved or something, and you know, now they're together, and so I just something like that, I think, would be really neat. Uh, just completely blow us away by subverting our expectations like that with the character Boa Fett. Um, he doesn't have to be the BA anymore. He yep. can just be a man who's who's looking to live the rest of his life in a way that's not just a benefit to himself. And I think that would be really cool. Or like you said, yeah, I'm totally cool with never seeing the guy again. You know, um, I think yeah. we will because honestly, I think that shot of him. Um, and if you listen very closely, you can hear he still has the spur sound when he walks. Yeah. I think he's the one who we saw in, in you know, the last season. Um, and and I think there's something to that. So uh, how all of that works out is going to be really fascinating. So I don't know, but obviously they had a plan. And, I mean, should we be surprised that Dave Filoni has a plan uh, and John Favreau has a plan? So all I can say is that I never thought I'd say I was excited to see Boba Fett again. But I'm excited to see Boba Fett again. And I'm actually excited, I hope, that we get to see um, Cobb again. So both of these guys. So who's the better Boba Fett? I don't know. But, John, maybe we should just ask the fans. So if people want to do that, where can they find you? Well, they can find me as Kessel Junkie on your social network of choice. Please help me quit Twitter. Go look for me over on Letterboxd or some other Anything else, Vero even, whatever. I I, I got to quit Twitter. So Kessel Junkie, K-E-S-S-E-L-J-U-N-K-I-E. You can also find me at KesselJunkie.com, sharing writings and drawings and stuff like that. And you can find me here on the network on House of Fincher, a retrospective uh, show about the directorial efforts of David Fincher, and a uh, forthcoming show called House of Nolan where we are examining the works of Christopher Nolan. But also I have the distinct honor, pleasure, of appearing over on another show that uh, you host, Matt, along with uh, Christy Morris, uh, called The 602 Club over on TFM Network. So uh, why don't you tell people where they can find you? Yeah, um, of course, uh, you can find me there uh, on Twitter under the moniker uh, The 602 Club, which follows the show that we do, that Christy and I do. John is a frequent guest there. Um, We're going to be having him back coming up. uh, Just put on the schedule uh, Christmas Chronicles 2, as well as we have a really fun series that we're going to do with John next year as well on the show, which is we're going to be going through all the Rambo movies together. So uh, that'll be really fun. 
Um, so some great yes. stuff that's going to be coming up. Um, you can also find me uh, personally on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and Vero under the name Matt Rushing Zero uh, Two. You can find me uh, just here uh, on the network doing outposts with Drake Kaufman as we talk about. Uh, Harry Potter each and every week, one chapter at a time. Over on TFM, I do the 602 Club, but I also do Literary Treks and The Orb. R- literary Treks is about the books and the comics of Star Trek, and then The Orb is all about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. So uh, with all that said, John, forget the temple. I think it's time to head back to the cantina because I need another glass of spatia. Oh, you know I am always on board for that. Jedi Master Matthew Rushing... Negotiations are closed. Join the revolution. Join the nerd party.